Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. And I'm Jenna Million. And this is a podcast where we challenge sexism in the music industry and empower fangirls. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And if you stick around long enough, we'll let you in on some new music the girls are already crazy about. So... We recently had a music trivia party on Zoom with some of you lovely listeners, and it was so much fun. It was chaotic as it would be with anything that I'm involved in because I don't know how to use the internet. I literally have never related more to a teacher in March 2020 trying to teach school. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to figure out Zoom when you have 20 people like just watching you. It was humbling. Oh, but truly. As stressful as it was, I think it turned out so well. So basically, we planned to like break out into teams. And then we, Sarah and I put together like five rounds of trivia, which was really fun building it too. But because we couldn't figure out Zoom in the breakout rooms, that wasn't going to work. And then somebody had the idea to just make Instagram like DM pods. So we all like went through the trivia together, but everyone was in their like Instagram DMs, like going back and forth with the <laughs> answers. And, it, and Sarah and I were just like watching all of them come in. It was so fun. I think it actually wound up working out better that way because we could all still just like be in a group. (laughs) Yeah, it really did work out better that way. I thought it was so fun. I think everyone had a really good time and it was one of those things where we were like, don't know how this is going to go, but it turned out even better than I hoped it would. It was just really fun because I feel like number one quarantine has made us all incredibly introverted because we don't know how to socialize anymore. And number two, I feel like most people in music are socially awkward in some way. (laughs) So the fact that like 15 of you were like, these people, we can handle them. Yeah, it was an honor. It was an honor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and also, I feel like Zoom things like this are nerve wracking because, like, one, you don't like know anyone else. Number two, it's like on Zoom and you're not sure how it's gonna go. But we're so grateful, y'all. <laughs> y'all braved the anxiety to join us because I think everyone had a good time and we were able to chat and get to know each other and hear what what other bands we like. It was really fun, and we're definitely going to be doing some more of them. So if you don't follow us on Instagram yet, you should come follow us there because that's where we tend to post most of our updates just because it's like the easiest platform to do that so that you can get involved next time because it was quite a blast i'm just gonna give a quick shout out to the people who did join we have sarah b meredith cassie soph Ern, Laura, Annika, Jaws, Matt and Josh from 1975 Pod, Dees, Bizu, Natalie, and Fernanda. They all had so much knowledge. It was insane how quickly these people knew answers to things. Like Ern and Bizu deserve like the biggest shout out ever. Because we would put something up and they'd be like, I got it. <laughs> I know the answer. So it was just really fun because we assume that everybody who listens to this knows a lot of music, but like watching it happen in real time was impressive to say the least. So yeah, if you want to find out about our future trivia is come hang out with us on Twitter and Instagram. And also, this is a six month anniversary for us. Our first episode dropped on August 16th. So this is coming out slightly after our six month anniversary. Honestly, incredible. We've made it this far. Like, <laughs> and that we have all of you guys who have been supporting us along the way. That means so much to us. And we love being able to do this every week. It thoroughly takes so much more time than I ever imagined it. So if you're enjoying what you're hearing, if you want us to keep doing this, you can come support us on our Patreon. We have some different tiers and some different goodies for y'all so that we can keep doing this and maybe one day turn it into our full-time jobs. Yeah, we need to buy books, guys. (laughs) Books are expensive. But with our six-month anniversary being noted, today we thought we would do something a little bit different from our regularly scheduled content and that is that we have never truly done an episode about ourselves we never have done and get to know us episode like if you've been listening along the way you've probably picked up the pieces of who we are and like got to know us that way and if you listen to any of our guest episodes where we've guested on other podcasts you might have heard a little bit more about us but we have never done an episode just for our podcast about ourselves it's so funny now that you've just like laid that out there because I'm like yeah we literally just started and we're like believe us please (laughs) yeah like we know music listen to us (laughs) that's so 
funny. There was no we credibility. Both, we rocked up with the confidence of two white men, and I am so proud of us for that. Everyone needs a little bit more of that in your life. Be like, be like us being like white men. <laughs> Yeah, just like pretend you're Chad for like 24 hours and you can do big things. So we're going to tell you about how we got our starts into the music industry. And then we're kind of going to talk about this podcast and where we've come along the way because it's been really eye opening. And if you've been along the journey for like with us, I think you also will realize how far we've come and the things we've realized and how much better we've gotten at this. Yeah, we've come a long way from me having to record an episode through a gamer headset. So... <laughs> So the past like seven episodes have been like emotionally exhausting, I think for everyone. So yeah. we just thought that this could be a nice little break. You guys can feel like we're actually friends because I do call you all my best friends to everyone. <laughs> and so you can learn a bit more about us and be like, oh, I was right in trusting these, <laughs> these crazy women. But so basically we've guested on a few podcasts and we've told our stories and Jenna has a much clearer origin story than I do because I always like forget how my life happened. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell each other's origin stories and then we're going to fill in the blanks for whatever the other person left out because yeah. we thought that it would be fun. <laughs> we thought it'd be a good challenge. Jenna, I don't know which random story that I've told you're going to choose to tell I mean I know all of them I like I have a good memory for this stuff so I'm ready to like nail it Jenna's gonna smash it and I'm just gonna be like so uh so let's just kick it off and get into our stories of how we got into the music industry so in 2001 Josie and the Pussycats was released into the world and Sarah's mother took her to go see this movie when she was eight years old nine nine and then her her mom realized maybe it was kind of an adult movie. But anyways, Sarah, because of this movie, was inspired to start drum lessons. And she wanted to be like Travis Barker because her uncle worked for Geffen Records. I'm so impressed. Is that right? It was like a, like a seventh cousin. <laughs> okay. An extended family member worked for Geffen Records and sent her a box of CDs. And one of those CDs was a Blink-182 CD. <laughs> along with, I want to say, that band that All Time Low is named after. <laughs> New Found Glory. Yes. New Found Glory was also in there. <laughs> yes. Okay. So because of this, Sarah was like, oh my God, like I need to be a drummer right now. And eventually she started a band with some of her high school friends, which was called Sour Milk. Sour Milk? Fat Skim free, Milk? Fat Free Milk. <laughs> fat Free Milk. Sour Milk, also a good band name if you want also to take that. Also a good band name. <laughs> but that only like lasted a week because somebody got grounded and then they couldn't. Nope practice anymore around this time sarah was also going to a lot of like pop punk gigs and one day like she was on the barricade and this lady in front of her was like taking photos professionally of this band and she didn't know that was a thing and she was like hey lady how can i do what you're doing and she was just like take your camera to shows so sarah started out with her film camera just going to all of her like pop punk shows like taking photos with her front camera flash and thomas falcone had to teach her how to use her digital camera for the first time so basically, Sarah was just like running around New York City as a teenager harassing bands with her camera being like, can I take photos of you? Or like, I'm taking photos of you. Give me your email and let's be friends. And then you can hire me next time you're in the city. So this really got Sarah going. This was in combination with growing up on MySpace as a teen and live journal and live journaling all of her experiences. And then eventually a publicist that she knew was like, hey, you should start bl a blog because that's like the next thing. And like, if you start blogging, I can get you interviews and more press and stuff like that. So Sarah did that, which led to her studying journalism in university and you went to university of westminster <laughs> i'm like so impressed i'm gonna fail so miserably <laughs> So she went to London for undergrad, studied journalism. I don't know if you have a I photography. photography for undergrad. Yeah. And befriended some British bands there. And then after undergrad, oh, and you also got to in, uh, intern with the enemy for two weeks, which was, I think, a pivotal life changing <laughs> experience for you. Yeah, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Because I feel like at that time they were like really cool and now it's not, <laughs> not as cool. But at that point in time, I did spend six months harassing the photo editor until she was like, okay, fine, you can come. 
Yeah. So by the time you got back to New York City, you were trying to befriend any br small British band that you could and shooting for various publications. And I don't know, I guess for work, you were working. I don't know what you were doing for work then. That was my gossip news, gossip news website at times okay. when I was a photo editor. <laughs> Just had to like find pics of Calvin Harris and Taylor Swift and take screen grabs of the Pillow Talk music video. <laughs> And this is why Sarah knows so much more pop culture than I do. <laughs> it lives so rent free in my brain. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. So then you went back to grad school at Goldsmiths mm -hmm. and you studied, I don't know what, I don't know what that, it's called. That was when I did journalism. <laughs> okay. And this is when I met Sarah. We had Twitter, mutual Twitter friends from the photo ladies community being female concert photographers. And then Sarah was going to start grad school at the time when I was going to study abroad. And I was in Bristol and she was in London. And then we became friends and then we hung out in each other's cities and stayed with each other, even though we had never met each other before. <laughs> but that worked out all right. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. And then um, after grad school, you came back over to America, ended up working for the e Evening Standard UK publication mm -hmm. until now when we started Name Three Songs. Yeah, we started Name Three Songs and two months later, the Evening Standard was like, hey, we, we don't need you anymore. I'm still mad about that. I will be upset about this for the rest of my life. I think I got a pretty good <laughs> overview, but was there any like super pivotal moments that kind of changed your career or like changed your, I guess not your necessarily your career, but like your inspiration, your motivation, your drive? My issue has always been that I love concert photography I love music journalism so much but I would go through these just like bouts of being like oh concert photography is really clicky <laughs> and I would just get really upset about it and I would kind of stop doing it for a little while and then I'd realize I just love doing this I'll try and just do it but this is like the most privileged issue I've ever had which is that <laughs> this feels like such an asshole thing to say but it's like I'm good at concert photography so <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of impossible to just do it for fun um, yeah. because the amount of times where somebody has been and this is like so humbling and incredible that this has happened but also not super great for my own psyche which is like almost every time where I've stopped and then come back and then been like oh I can do this as a job again somebody hires me and they wind up being a complete asshole and then ruining everything and I'm back to square one again and this has happened like three times so it's got awful pattern in my life of me being like oh these men want to give me a chance I guess I guess I can do it and then the men being like actually we hate See, this you. is the problem is like instead of relying on the men to give you a chance we need to start making our own chances well true but they're the ones that are in the bands <laughs> I know. Yeah, so I don't know. I guess that up until 2017, I just was always like, oh, concert photography and music journalism is just something that I do for fun. It's not anything that I ever think I could take super seriously just because it didn't feel like it was. And I think also at that time, and it still is super saturated there's just so many concert photographers and people doing the same thing because I think we've said this a couple times but like concert photography is a really easy gateway into the world of working in the music industry because basically like concert photography is just a super easy thing to do because if you're willing to buy your own ticket to a show nine times out of ten a publicist will give you a photo pass so I kind of was just like oh there's no point I have this career in journalism already like I'll be fine and then in 2017 I just started getting actually hired like sought out where people were contacting me being like hey we saw your photos on like this blog or we saw your photos here we want to work with you and I was like oh because for my whole life up until that point it was always me being like here's my business card. <laughs> like you can pay me. And then people started showing interest and I was like, oh damn. So I guess that that was sort of that pivotal point. And I started being able to write for bigger publications and shoot for bigger publications. And I guess like the big thing that sort of catapulted everything was right before I left for London, I got hired to shoot Jack Antonoff for the cover of Substream magazine. And so that kind of set more things into motion for like when I moved to London to be able to do more freelance photography for bigger places because I could just be like, here's here's what I shot for like this publication. And they're like, oh, okay, this is a publication we have heard of and a person we've heard of and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. so now it's my turn to completely fuck up Jenna's origin story. 
because my brain is a sieve. I can tell you exactly when Harry Styles and Kendall, Kendall Jenner were first spotted on a yacht together, but can I tell you anything about my friends? No. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, this is the thing, is Jenna's dark and mysterious, whereas I can't shut the fuck up. (laughs) So Jenna also started liking music with pop punk music (laughs) and All Time Love was her favorite band ever. Yeah. And I guess my issue is with this story is I have no idea when Tumblr was a thing, but at some point Jenna got sucked into the world of Tumblr and became the aesthetic that TikTok teens think is cool. Yeah, the the 2014 Tumblr aesthetic was my life. Yeah, so she, she she fell off the boat, well she still loves pop punk, but she fell off the boat of pop punk for a bit and <laughs> became um, an indie internet kid of yeah. uh, making flower crowns and wearing them to all time low shows. Truly. <laughs> and secretly pining to be a lot of a very specific phase of my life so you started with concert photography right you started yeah doing essentially the same thing that i was doing which was yeah. bringing your camera to shows shooting stuff you started your own blog right mm-hmm. and then did you did you do stuff with friend like other friends blogs too or was it just your own i like interned quote unquote interned for like uh these college girls who had a blog that's how i first got photo passes that's how i first figured out how to write stuff Mm -hmm. and then i took a journalism and photography class in high school and then i just started doing things on my own from there we both took the easiest gateway in but at the time we did not know it was the easiest gateway in but we because i guess like we both we both were really passionate about just like photography and journalism and i think that we Because I mean, my whole thing when I started, and it it seems like the same thing with you, is that we just were like, we want to show that we can have access that like other people have too, even though we were just dumb high school, college kids doing whatever we wanted. We just wanted access so that we could eventually work in the music industry in some way. Yeah, I I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, I was fascinated with taking photos and I like, I, I really wanted to be like close to the music and capturing that stuff. Yeah. And I remember I started when I was 16. And my first show was the main. The first show I ever shot was the main. I, for a very long time, was the only underage photographer in Austin. I don't remember ever coming across another underage photographer until I was like maybe 20. But like when I was 16, I was by far like no one else was underage like shooting shows. I was the only one. And so I was like in there with all these pros and I was the only one who would have like an underage wristband or like X's (laughs) on my hands. And I was like so like scared of them because I was like, oh my God, they're professionals. And like, I'm just like, because I was super shy when I was younger. So I would never talk to them. But then over the years of just being in the same pit with them, I eventually like kind of got to know them. I didn't really build a rapport with them until I was like, actually properly working in the Austin music scene when I was in college. When I first started shooting, I was like 15. And from like 16 to 18, almost all of my friends were fellow teenage concert photographers. But I think also just like New York is probably a bigger... Yeah. More of a situation of just city kids' parents just being like, oh, you're supervised? Go have fun. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Go do what you want. So basically, you got the bug for the industry from doing photography and journalism. Yeah. And you were like, what else can I do? I really want to work at festivals. So when you were in college, you got an internship at Margin Walker, which is like, uh, I don't know what they're called. <laughs> they're a concert promoter. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like knew what they did. I didn't know that. Wait, what? Where did I go to school and what did I study? You went to University of Texas, but I don't know if that's like a specific campus that I need to specify. I mean, that's the main one now. It's called UT Austin because there's other campuses, but that's like if you say UT, it's that one. Okay, and you studied like mass media and communications, public relations, public relations. Okay, was close. So did you study that because you wanted to do journalism or did you study that because you wanted to work in PR management, that sort of side of things? I originally applied to the School of Journalism and I got Mm. into the School of Journalism. And before I even started as a freshman, I switched it to PR, which is kind of amazing because if I would have waited, it would have been way more difficult to switch it because I was like realizing that I was interested in more than just journalism and PR is a lot of writing. So I knew that like I had that foundation and I was good at it and I enjoyed writing, but I knew I could also learn other things because at UT, the PR track and the advertising track are basically the same thing. So Mm -hmm. I got to learn about the advertising marketing side of things, which is what I'm really interested in. You got 
an internship at Margin Walker and you got to work a festival but I can't remember the name of it but it's like it's a big sound on town yeah and so sound on sound festival which is also in Austin which I guess is it is a big deal there I don't know about well festivals. so the promoters from Margin Walker had just left this other promotion company because there was like a big buyout like there was lots of drama but basically they used to produce this festival called fun 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 which was 10 years running in austin and it was like a really big deal mm -hmm. and once that company like was bought out they left they started sound on sound which ended up only running for the single year that i was there mm -hmm. but it was an amazing experience yeah so she she got to help put on a festival. She was 21 when they did it. So she got to like have all the free booze that you get when you work at festivals. I didn't is... drink then. <laughs> you missed out on the best part of being backstage at a festival. Maybe. Says the person who anytime I've worked at a festival, I just wind up like drunk on a golf cart. So. <laughs> <laughs> so her internship was so good that she almost tried to drop out of college. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> because she was like, this is my life now. It turned from an internship into a job. Like they yeah. hired me as their marketing assistant. And that's when I almost dropped out of college. When I was but if junior. she had dropped out of college, she never would have came to England and we wouldn't yeah. have fallen in love. So. <laughs> <laughs> also true. <laughs> so really. <laughs> yeah. She made the best choice. <laughs> So she did that and then she came to England and we hung out. We became besties. She also, this is my favorite me and Jenna story that also has to do with her music career, <laughs> is that she did like this really great interview with this band called Blind Avon, And I had interviewed them like a couple months before I moved to England, but I like spent like two or three days with them. <laughs> and we saw the singer, his name's Ben, and we saw him at Spitalfields Market and Jenna's like, oh my God, we know him. And she was like, we have to say something but because she was like shy and I'm loud I literally like jumped out from behind her corner. you scared him so bad I scared the shit out of him but then he was like very excited to see me and then I was like oh like this is my friend Jenna and he was like oh my god she literally was like had this whole speech ready to remind him who she was and she was like oh like I'm Jenna and he was like I know you you did that really great interview of us when we were in Texas yeah he was like I read that recently I think it's the best interview we've ever done he's like can you send it to me again <laughs> oh my god and we and it was just like the funniest thing ever and then he was like asking me where I was living and we wound up living in the same neighborhood and he was like oh we do karaoke at this pub you guys should come to karaoke with us and then he never answered any of my text messages <laughs> 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 and it was Oy. just so funny because like neither Jenna or I were like went into this being like oh we should invite him to do something he invites us to do karaoke of all things and then was like never mind too much commitment to friendship <laughs> yeah and then and then they were playing a show in Bristol really soon and I told him and he was like oh do you need tickets and I was like no I already have mine and then Sarah was like you should have like said what he was seen what he was gonna offer we could have been friends Ben <laughs> All right, what's the rest of my origin story? Well, you went back to Texas and you were like freaking out because you didn't know what you wanted to do with your life. And you were like, I'm going to go to Vietnam and teach people English. And you didn't like that. So then you came back to me in England. <laughs> Oh my god, Sarah, do you remember? I had just been in Europe. I flew yeah. from Vietnam to Europe to England and you were coming back from like a trip to Morocco. Yeah. And your flight was delayed like two days and then horrible. like you were sick. And like the the moment we saw each other, we like hugged each other and like almost started crying. <laughs> I think we, we were crying. We had both had like the it most, was super like, traumatic for both of us. <laughs> like it was just like the most ridiculous thing ever. Where like Jenna was having a hard time in Vietnam. I was working at a yacht magazine <laughs> and like which I was enjoying, but it was just very much not where I thought I was going to be. And then I got a job to go shoot like an influencer trip to Morocco, which wound up being like a, an amazing trip but also kind of not what I was hired to do <laughs> and Jenna was having a hard time I got stuck in the Morocco airport for two days and then by the time Jenna and I reunited I think I had had like also food poisoning from airport food and we like met up in Clizzled Park in Stoke Newington because <laughs> she was supposed to stay with me and I was like hey you can't because I don't know when the hell I'm getting out of Morocco because <laughs> they kept bringing us broken planes it was like such a mess and then we literally just like cried in each other's arms essentially <laughs> I think that really solidified our friendship. Everything so. until that point was like, we were like kind of friends, but then we were like true friends. 
there was like a whole like six honestly even more longer but six months when i was out of the country not doing anything music related yeah, yeah. well i think what job do, were you were you interning or doing something when you went back or did i make that up no yeah i had a pr internship in austin i was still shooting i was still help booking shows and stuff we threw a show for south by stuff like that but my my internship wasn't for music I feel like this is common and something that people should just be aware that happens. Like when you do a ton of internships in college, once you have like that dream one, if you get another one that doesn't live up to it, you're going to question everything you've ever done. And that's completely normal, but you don't need to because that's the whole point of internships is to get the experience to figure out what the hell you want to be doing and like yeah. the field that you want to work in. So I guess learn from our mistakes, essentially, <laughs> which is like things do get better. I think it's important. I mean, I especially think it's important to have a lot of internships because a lot of different internships because you yeah. may realize you thought you like something and you actually don't or whatever and that confirmed for me like i don't want to do pr as a job it's good that i know it but like i don't want to be a publicist because i mean with me like all of my internships have been in like the photo department at like magazines or online publications and so i've aggressively pigeonholed myself so don't do that but yeah so then you had that and then you had the existential crisis that most people have but at least you were young when you had it so you escaped the world and then when you came back to texas you didn't start music right away right you were doing something else so i was working at a coffee shop for a long time that was connected to a skate store and like honestly humbling experience but i ended up getting a lot of photography gigs by working at the coffee skate shop yeah. like a lot of gigs like paid gigs like adidas paid me a couple hundred dollars to shoot one of their events which was sick yeah i made i made like really good connections it's entirely unrelated to the music scene but cool people just like artistic fun people and i got to do a lot of fun photo projects with that so it was very fulfilling yeah i think that that's like a good lesson to learn from these things is it's like just because you don't have the exact career you want to have if you can't get a job in your dream industry find a niche coffee shop or restaurant or record store or something like that where you never know who you're gonna meet because there's nothing wrong with not working exactly where you want to be because who knows who the next person you're gonna help is gonna be yeah definitely i think having a social job like that was really good too while i was still job searching of like just having social skills but like like sarah said you never know who you're gonna meet and then yeah i ended up getting a job with musics which was one of my first internships doing i do digital marketing for them and it's a startup company and we have a app for sharing music with your friends but that's been nice working at a startup because you get to be super hands-on and do anything your heart desires <laughs> So I, I didn't do terribly. I feel like I knew the bare bones, but you also just like don't give details. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All like the elaboration the... was because I've never shared that stuff before. It's so funny. John and I have been friends for like, what, four years now? And she'll be like, yeah, I'm working at, like I'm interning at this PR place. And then I just don't know anything else other than yeah. like she's interning somewhere. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I guess like through all of your changes in thoughts of what you want to do in the music industry and where you are now, like, I feel like we already talked about a lot of important lessons, but like, what's the most important thing that you learned or what was like the most pivotal moment where you realized what you wanted to be doing? So when I worked at Margin Walker for a year, that year of my life was just like one of the most formative, like life-changing of everything because I was in this transition phase. I was 21. I was like discovering the world and also learning because the thing they don't teach you in college is how to actually be an adult, <laughs> how to actually work, be a professional. They like they don't teach you that. Like they don't teach you how to write emails professionally, which is like 101. So my biggest takeaway from that internship, both being an intern and then having interns underneath me was that you really need to like step up and like be present ask questions provide suggestions like have ideas mm -hmm. and there are some internships where they're going to tell you a lot of no's because of how corporate it is but if you're working at a small company there's a lot of room to grow and that's why they hired me because i was such a go-getter like i worked with three other interns there was four of us we all had the same position we were essentially just writing copy for social media and we all shared 
shared one single email account and then we would like sign off our name whenever we sent emails. And by the end of the first week, the owner of the company knew my name as an intern because I was so proactive about answering emails and I was so efficient and like thorough with them. Mm -hmm. And so really just proving yourself and being hungry and like not just doing the assignment, but asking what else you can do. Because I've seen so many interns, they just show up, they do what they're told and they go home. And that's not, they're not leaving an impression. You're not really learning that much if you're not like actively engaging and like asking questions and stuff like that. So that truly was like one of my biggest pieces of advice if you're younger and if you want to get internships, that's my definitely my biggest piece of advice. And then once they hired me, it was very eye-opening to see like how the world of the industry works because like they would invite me to like their partnership meetings and we would go like site visits and we would go talk to different people and I was part of the marketing team. And so I got to see a lot of those inner workings that you don't get to see as an intern. So I was like truly like really lucky in that regard. And for that year, they were like my family. I was really close to them and gave me professional advice, but also like personal life advice stuff. So yeah, I mean, I I always point back to that for sure. It's just so interesting, like the different routes there are into doing anything within the music industry, because I feel like a lot of the time people don't necessarily view, they'll be like, oh, like journalists, who do mu- like music journalists, like they're not really part of it. But it's like, no, we're like in the thick of <laughs> all of it. But it's just those like small tastes of what it's like working on the inside to realize that like when you are doing journalism that you have so much more of a stake than you realize and like yeah all we do is talk about the media on this podcast so yeah exactly I mean it it shapes everything and this is the thing is it's like the more people like us who do do stuff in music journalism the more likely it is that it'll change because Mm -hmm. I've done so many interviews where I've had my editors be like you got a lot out of them this is really good and I'll be like yeah I didn't tell you the other stuff I got that I didn't put in because the one thing that I am like very proud of myself is like I can be very personable and I feel like a lot of artists have been like oh like I was really comfortable talking to you which is like a very big compliment yeah definitely and also it's just always that thing where it's like with Ben saying like how because your interview with them was really good it's asking different questions or just making them feel like they're hanging out with friends or whatever it is that you're doing I think it's really clear when like journalists are doing it just because they want to be close to cool people Mm -hmm. versus like when you actually care being personal like you said is so important in journalism and even in photography too making Mm -hmm. your subjects comfortable but that's definitely something you have to learn from doing it like I was not naturally like good at talking to people. So it was really hard for me to learn that. Like you'll read interviews with like these like A-list celebrities and stuff and like how we've talked about like One Direction, how they were treated by that guy from GQ where like they're just trying to trip you up, and, like get nonsense out of you. And this is the other thing that's like Jenna and I have been talking about a lot in wanting to get more artists involved and like doing other things with them than we already have is it's like while PR is technically supposed to be there to like make sure they don't say anything stupid. Nobody cares <laughs> from my experience. I mean, for a while, I, I had a YouTube channel called Boozing Bands where I would literally have artists come to my apartment. I would get them drunk and I would interview them. And like, it was all like small artists mainly. But I mean, some of these artists had like publicists and the publicists were like, we love this. We'll send the artist to your apartment to get drunk with you. And I was like, cool, <laughs> awesome. And every time when I would send these emails, I was so careful. I'd be like, oh, like, I'll send you the video before I upload it so that you can approve it. Nine times out of 10, I would send them and they clearly did not watch the video. But I'm not the kind of person that's going to try and sabotage somebody if they're drunk on my sofa. Like, that's ridiculous. (laughs) But there are people who would do that, who would, like, get people drunk or get people on a show like ours and be like, oh, how do you feel about sexism? And just hope that they fucked up. The music industry is so wild and I feel like they very much are in the camp of any press is good press (laughs) which I feel like most of our listeners are aware of because I feel like all of you from what we've heard of like the artists that you like and stuff almost all of these artists that you love have been treated poorly in one way or another whether that be by the press or by their management or what have you yeah so I think we should talk a little bit about the podcast and kind of why we started it and how we've seen it evolve and how far it's come since then so But yeah, I mean, I guess it sort of goes hand in hand with what I was just saying was it's like there is that frustration of sort of watching the music industry kind of implode on itself. 
in a way, whether that be by how the media talks about artists or the way that artists are made to feel like they have to prove something. And just other people in the industry always sort of acting like women are like an oddity, even though, as I've said a bazillion times on our TikTok and anywhere anybody will listen to me, like the music industry and rock music in general were built on the backs of women. Rock music wouldn't exist without Black women and the Beatles and music in general wouldn't exist without screaming girls. It's just that constant frustration that we've all have felt and I guess with the music industry coming to a halt through COVID and still seeing like these clicks and these people talking about how like oh like there's not enough girls and not doing anything about it the frustration for me and I feel like what you're saying is people love to talk about it and do nothing about it or yeah. feel like and it's easy to feel like it's out of your control but like tweeting higher women on tour is not helping the conversation like just tweeting that is not helping the conversation like be about it you know yeah and i think that's so frustrating and i feel like we've been able to come so far with these conversations and the music industry is so big and there are organizations who like are you know fighting the same fight as us but I don't know. I it, it feels like in the media, there's not a lot of people. Like there are certain journalists who are really good, like Laura Snapes, for example. She's an incredible journalist. Mm -hmm. But it's so far and few between. The main underlying reason to why we started this podcast was Jenna and I have the same frustrations within the music industry of just like women not being respected enough, the music that they like being not being respected enough. And most of the women whose voices you hear when men are like, we need to help more women. It's always the same women. They're already successful. They've been successful for a long time. And it's like, you can only learn so much from people who are in the thick of it, who already have success, who are already yeah. doing things because- yeah, I agree obviously in life they still have hardships as women and like in their careers I'm sure there are still instances but I'm sure that they're far and few between compared to like the rest of us who haven't built up the like notoriety and so it doesn't really help anyone constantly hearing the same stories from the same people and so with both of our journalism background with Jenna's behind the scenes background with my professional journalism background like we felt like we come from a place that isn't heard from a lot when the mic is passed to women in the music industry and so we just were like okay you know what let's just have the conversations that we wish these people were having and hope people listen and then people showed up <laughs> yeah in amazing numbers we never we never thought I mean, we never expected the reaction that we got, but I think also with this podcast, as we build it up, we want to continue passing to the mic to other people. And that's why we are trying to have a variety of different guests on who can share their expertise and their personal lived experiences. Because fans are important and being a fan, even if you are a professional, is important because most people who are actually properly successful and like do really well is because the people who back them are passionate about them, like on their team and elsewhere and so I feel like it's so uncommon for women to feel comfortable being an outspoken fan of the artists that they're interviewing or the artists that they're talking about or working with because we're made to feel like oh like if we say we're a fan of them they're gonna think that we have a crush on them or they're gonna think we're attracted to them or whatever the case is and I feel like that's ridiculous because if I went to a restaurant and the, the chef was like yeah I hate everything I'm cooking I'm like I don't want to eat here so why would I want to buy a CD where like maybe their team doesn't like their music like that's silly yeah yeah and I feel like we, when you read interviews you can tell if an interviewer respects the artist and stuff and like you know it's not fun reading an interview when the interviewer doesn't care and so it just is important for us to be able to be like hey yeah like we're passionate about this because we're really passionate about music and we're fans of these artists and we care about them and being able to give other people in the industry who are open and happy being like yeah I am a fan maybe I'm a groupie who fucking knows who fucking <laughs> cares and just to give other fans who don't have industry experience the chance to share their stories and possibly help them in whatever way we can to be like hey because you don't work in the industry this is how we can make this make sense yeah and i think from the people who reached out to us like a lot of people have identified with our podcast in one way or another maybe they're just a fan who felt like because of their age they weren't allowed to still like a boy band mm -hmm. or they felt like they've never been taken seriously or they're young and they've been afraid to get into the industry because of the horror stories so i think like having this conversation is eye-opening for a lot of us and this is what we said with the sexual misconduct 
contact episodes is like there are conversations that we need to keep having that are not a one and done conversation just because it happens once like it's gonna keep happening again i mean we're gonna keep having these conversations until things are like systematically changed which is like a long way off but a good goal to uh change the the patriarchy i would rather tear down the patriarchy and build a better system would be a proper way to go about it yeah the response to a lot of these episodes are like coming with other thoughts and ideas and like we want we want to cover as much as we possibly can so any topic we've already done we're going to cover in other ways at some point but unfortunately there is so much content (laughs) for us to talk about because essentially any female artist has some sort of horror story that we can discuss and any male artist who has had a lot of female fans also has stories that we can discuss and it's just in a way heartbreaking but also hopefully in talking about it and sort of being like hey we we acknowledge what you're doing here hopefully we can change something so i want to kind of like both of us kind of share our most like eye-opening part about this and i think as you mentioned earlier in the podcast it has been a rough couple of weeks with the topics we've been covering have been very heavy and for us like we do copious amounts of research and then watching the free britney thing and then watching the promising young woman and then hearing from melissa schumann from dream who like reached out to us or like found our podcast last week i was like it was a heavy load man like (laughs) We've for real had some intense episodes and this is the first time that it's like really built up on me and I've like felt the weight of just everything that we've been discussing and it is it's so heavy but it's at the same time it felt really good to know that we're talking about it in like a productive way that's like helping other people out there because a lot of times it's easy to get caught up and just like doing the next thing and the next thing and not like stopping and thinking about like what type of reaction things are having but like when Mm -hmm. we hear from y'all when we hear your stories it's so just like amazing to to know that it's resonating with people but especially i think the sexual misconduct ones especially because i i had no expectations for like what were going to happen with those but like the fact that like other people out there thank you for doing this like it just shows how important these conversations are yeah i mean i echo everything that you just said there because i mean it's just crazy because i don't know since we started just the amount of messages that we've gotten of other girls and not even just girls being just like hey this is necessary this is so important i'm so glad you're doing this all these things and it's just so humbling and so crazy because as we've said we never really expected anything because who knows whose ears something are gonna fall on like who knows how that sort of happens and just the fact that people are continuously just being like we love what you're building here we love what you're doing it's insane because we put in so much work we read so much we do all these things and it's like for me especially because my whole life has been pop culture media since I started interning when I was like 19 years old. All this stuff has just always lived in my brain and been like, how do I fix it? How do I change this? And I feel like there's potential to do that now because people are reaching out and being like, thank you for talking about this. Thank you for doing this. Because we have no idea when we drop an episode, what the response is going to be like, if people are going to be like, you shouldn't be talking about this. You have no business doing this or whatever the case is, because it's not normal for people to essentially just like reopen wounds to be like hey let's talk about this let's talk about that because it's just not it's just not normal it's it's easier for society to just like talk about it for a few days and move on and i think that's why like the past couple weeks have felt so heavy for us is because unless you're directly tied to like unless you're a survivor or you struggle with mental health or whatever it is you you personally are like carrying a very heavy load but for people who are not directly tied to that they're just like going about their lives because not everyone can care about everything all the time and so it's easy to forget get that these things are so important but when we like stack them up next to each other like this and we're looking at them and doing all the research and like thinking about it critically for like weeks on end it is like holy crap it just builds up because it's so easy to think it's it's one instance here it's one instance there and then you look at it all together it's truly heartbreaking it's just crazy especially with like our episode with muses about like these overshadowed women it's it's become so normal to just be like hey rihanna want to talk about Chris Brown it's like yes I know 
that Rihanna and Chris Brown have been like off and on and like whatever but it's still just like the media are enablers <laughs> like of so many things and the fact that like Billboard has essentially given redemption interviews to like Ben Hopkins from uh, Power Bottom and Jake from Front Porch Stop and like Jake fully in that Billboard interview admitted to everything and it's like you have in writing probably also in a recording why is this man not in jail so it it just boggles my mind that the same publications who write these like lengthy seemingly heartfelt articles about abuse or allegations or what have you will then a year later have these people back and be like hey we see you're trying to restart your career you were good before you touched that child want to talk to us again now it's like what the fuck and so it's heart-wrenching because we fall into the same camp of almost none of these artists were artists that I really cared about so it's like I read about it I'm upset about it and then I forget about it because that's what they that's what we're taught to do we're just like oh okay that was handled but it's not handled (laughs) and so it's it's just so frustrating and kind of ridiculously upsetting to do this research and realize that something that you thought was essentially dealt with was never dealt with and then you feel guilty for stopping paying attention and it's just a lot of emotions and I feel like that's why we thought it was so important to talk about Yeah, so I think as heavy as it has been the past few weeks, it's overwhelmingly still in a positive light for us being able to know that these stories are connecting with people and feel like we're making progress here. Like that's such a positive feeling. And another huge thing that I personally have learned as doing this is like, we all know sexism exists. We know there's a pay gap but most people don't think about it on a regular basis of how it affects their lives. And I think through doing this and through thinking critically and having these hard conversations, I personally have learned so much. Like it's opened my eyes to the fact that like, hey, we grew up in a sexist society. We all Mm -hmm. have things we have to unlearn. Like we, we were taught those as we grew up so we can unlearn them too, but we have to put in the effort into unlearning them. And I think that's where a lot of people just forget about sexism and go on with their life. And my biggest hope is that our listeners will also be able to think critically about their personal lives and their personal relationships and be able to be confident in standing up for themselves and or saying something or telling someone or reaching out when you need help. But just the fact that there's so many people out there who aren't on a daily basis thinking about sexism Mm -hmm. and are doing things that can be considered microaggressions because it's just quote unquote normal in our society. I completely agree. I guess it's just the goal hasn't always has been to resonate with people and to make people feel seen and heard. And the fact that we've done that, even when the topics are hard for us to talk about, makes everything worth it because we're learning ourselves. We're becoming more critical thinkers. And it sounds like a lot of our listeners are too, which is incredible. Yeah. I'm just yeah. so proud That's of all like of us. <laughs> already so already so fulfilling, like because of all of this. So I would say to to wrap it up with a lighter note, Sarah, what's your wildest dream for this podcast? I have like four. <laughs> Number one, get Halsey on. Yeah, my number one is to get Halsey on this podcast because I feel like she is essentially first most a fan. <laughs> like, Do you think we can do that thing where we make a YouTube video like, Halsey, we have a dare for you. We'll be like on Cody YouTube. Carson in 2008 daring Alex Gascard. <laughs> YouTubers do this to each other all the time. Like smaller YouTubers like challenge the bigger YouTubers and then people comment and they see it and they're like, oh. I mean, hey, let's start a campaign. I feel like Halsey would do it. I think that she would be the ideal guest because she's a music fan. She just loves music. She fangirls on Twitter. I just feel like she would fit perfectly and that we would have a really interesting conversation because it would be really cool to talk with somebody who's dealt with the media in the way that we always are like, hey, the media does this because she's just always like, hey, why why are you doing this? And she calls it out. And so I feel like that's one of my big goals. My other two are... I think that Ash and Erwin should come on the podcast so that he can try and explain what he means. I'll ask him, I'll read back quotes he said, and he can try and explain what he was trying okay, that to would be say funny. to me. Um, and then, I and then we I- can prove once and for all if he, if he means well and just doesn't know what he's saying. And or- then I- <laughs> 
<laughs> and then I can explain to him that he gets within three centimeters of the point, dances around it, says something stupid, and then gets there. But because he got there so late after he said the stupid thing, I don't hear the it point. It disregards the point. <laughs> disregards the point. So I think that that would be really fun for everyone because... We do have a few Five Sauce fans who have stuck around and don't seem to hate me. So I appreciate you all. You know who you are. (laughs) And then I think that it would be really cool to, once we're like more successful and can have like bigger artists on, I think it would be really cool to be able to like do a segment where we let them have conversations with fans and just like give the opportunity for us to have the discussion, like a fan take, but with the artist essentially. Ooh. I feel like that could be really interesting. Because this is the other thing is like when you see artists do Q&As with their fans or like when it's a journalist who's like, oh, the fans sent in the questions. It'll be like, what's your favorite color? And it's like, there are fans out there who have critical questions like they want answered. Well, I just feel like it would be interesting. Like this would never happen. But it's like if Maddie Healy was bored enough to like come have an introspective conversation and have like a fan or two on to be like, hey, you said this thing. And as a fan, it made me question something. Essentially, we want want to have interventions for these artists from their fans on the podcast that would be amazing (laughs) I just think it'd be interesting for somebody like Maddie who has like the persona of like caring a lot but sometimes he like oversteps where it's like oh like how did the actual fans like in Dubai feel about what happened at that show or like oh like how did somebody feel about like him speaking out about something that maybe wasn't his place to and having that conversation with him I feel like that could be really interesting yeah I think for me, as I mentioned, like my biggest hope with this is that it makes people think about the way they grew up and the way they act and the way they live their lives. And I think part of that, and this isn't like measurable, but part of that is having those discussion with the men in this industry also, which we're Mm -hmm. currently working towards having more discussions with them on this podcast. But I've always just brought up the point that like, we can't have this conversation with only half of the population on this planet. It takes everyone to work through this. And especially because men are the one in power. They're the ones who perpetrate a lot of these things. We really can't get anything done without them. So we do have to meet them somewhere. And I would love to have conversations that makes them realize just the sexism that they grew up with. Like whether or not they personally have done questionable things, even just recognizing the fact that they have internalized sexism they have internalized misogyny that would be incredible just to have someone say that because of a conversation with us it's changed the way they think and the way they live their life like that to me would be uh, amazing we have gotten messages of people being like oh like because of listening to this episode like i've realized like x y or z so i feel like it's completely possible to do it it's just getting the men on (laughs) i know yeah yeah people who have some i don't want to say power people who have an audience people who have say in the industry like i would love to continue having these conversations with with them i know that's not like a measurable thing but that's one of my dreams for this podcast i mean essentially it is a measurable thing because it's um seeing if they promote the episode after they've done it (laughs) (laughs) that and um we want to write a book someday. Yes. <laughs> Always been a goal mine to write a book. Hopefully that book can be like, how we changed things. I feel like that's the sequel. <laughs> yeah. Flash forward to five years in the future. Wow. Oh my God. Imagine listening to this back five years from now. Wow. Even a year from now. Wow. <laughs> so much can happen. So much happened in the last six months and it feels like we've barely been doing this any time at all. I know. It's Imagine crazy. what's going to happen in a year. Six more months. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I'm very proud of us. I'm proud of all of our listeners. I love yeah. you all. <laughs> yeah. What Sarah said, we're proud of you. We love <laughs> you. We're so glad we could go through this journey together with you guys. Yeah. Just come and show your faces more on social. Because there's like so many of you who listen to these episodes and we know like 30 of you. <laughs> Yeah, so we hope you learned something. We hope that maybe we made you realize that your hopes and dreams of becoming somebody in the music industry aren't that far-fetched. The music industry isn't as inaccessible as everybody, I think, thinks it is. Just start writing. (laughs) Start photographing things. Harass people. Right now, nobody's doing anything. I think just slide in people's DMs. Good point. Ask people people how they got their start. Yeah. Yeah. 
But also, if you do, like, want an entry into the music industry, because journalism and photography is, like, so easy, but also there's other career paths. Like, <laughs> being a sound engineer is dope. And there's, like, 2% of, like, Billboard 100 artists are like, female sound engineers. So, like, we really, like, need more people. And even if you, like, want to be a musician, don't let anyone crush those dreams, man. If you want to do it, do it. Don't let anyone stop you. Like, there's so many careers out there that you can do from lights to sound to literally anything being a songwriter yeah you don't have to be famous managing to be successful (laughs) yeah there's lots of jobs so yeah my advice to you is if you want to be in the music industry find somebody who's like at assistant level and slide in their instagram dms because i'm assuming that they'll probably answer you because we're bored (laughs) and i feel like a lot of us like to teach people it also makes people feel cool so yeah so if you have any questions comments concerns for us if you want our advice on the industry you can slide in our dms at name three songs on instagram twitter tiktok talk and then personally i'm at sarah underscore fagan and jenna's at jenna underscore million so thanks for joining us on name three songs until next time never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band and remember you're never too cool to listen to harry styles don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out and leave us a five-star review we really help if you want to find out more about any of the sources we referenced in this episode like my incredible interview with blind event you can visit name three songs.com